Good evening. Our worship this evening begins our observance of the Triduum, the great three days during which we journey with Jesus to the cross and meditate on his passion. We begin the Triduum tonight with Maundy Thursday. Maundy comes from the Latin word mandatum, meaning commandment. Tonight we remember Jesus' final commandment, that we should love one another as he loved us. And we see his love for us displayed in his passion. Our worship this evening does not conclude. Instead, it will pause, and it will continue tomorrow night with our Good Friday observance. I'll invite you to join me now in the confession. Even among Jesus' closest disciples, not all were clean. On this night of all nights, we confess the ways we disappoint, deny, and even betray Jesus, our teacher and our Lord. Our confession of sin is made in the sure knowledge that Jesus is able to wash us in forgiveness and love. Holy God, you have called us to serve others as Christ has served us. We confess that we have not followed Christ's example as fully or as often as we should. We turn away from people in need. True humility eludes us, and we hide our own vulnerability before others. You have commanded us to love one another as you have loved us. We confess that we do not love so generously. Gathered on this Holy Thursday, we confess that we are capable of denying and betraying you and one another, no less than the first disciples. Forgive us, merciful God, and cleanse us of all our sin. Then guide our feet to walk with you always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Eternal God, in the sharing of a meal, your Son established a new covenant for all people. And in the washing of feet, he showed us the dignity of service. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these signs of our life and faith may speak again to our hearts, feed our spirits, and refresh our bodies. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Exodus 12, verses 1 through 4 and 11 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. This is how you shall eat it, your loins skirted, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it 
as a perpetual ordinance. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, knowing that he had come from God and that he was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not now know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, Lord, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus answered, one who has bathed does not need to wash except the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he already knew who was to betray him, and for this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet and had put on his robe, he returned to the table and said to them, Do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. And that's right, for that's what I am. And so if I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example so that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jewish authorities, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Maundy Thursday is when the bottom falls out. It's when this wild ride that Jesus and his friends have been on for the last three or so years finally comes grinding to a halt. When familiar faces scatter and all is lost in fear and confusion. Have you ever had the bottom fall out? Maybe it was when a loved one died. The world didn't seem the same place it had just a few days earlier. Or perhaps it was when you learned something new or came to some realization that shook your faith to its core, your faith in God, or your faith in humanity, or even your faith in yourself. You were left not knowing which way was up, not knowing what to do next, or even how to pick yourself up for the next thing. Maybe it was a betrayal, a friend, a sibling, a parent, maybe even a spouse showed you a side of themselves that you had never known was there, and that after that moment, you could never unknow. 
If you've ever had the bottom fall out, you know that something always dies. Belief, an idea, a hope, a relationship. But always a piece of yourself dies with it. Something dies and everything is forever changed. There is no going back to normal. There is only enduring until the new normal begins to settle out of the chaos. But in order to endure, there must be some hope that eventually the dust will, in fact, settle. This year during Lent, we've been exploring that promise, that covenant, by hearing the stories of Noah and Abraham and Moses and Jeremiah. Each of these characters experienced God's salvation in new ways, whether it was rescue from a flood, a new home and a new family, freedom from slavery and a promised homeland, the law of God written on hearts like stone tablets. And like those characters, every generation of Israelites experiences a new salvation, settlement, judges, monarchy, prophetic reform, exile, return. The story of scripture isn't about a singular salvation. It shows us a pattern of continual salvation, which promises that the pattern will continue on into our present and beyond, into our future. Each of these stories of salvation is part of the same story that we call covenant. God's continual work to settle the dust and cobble together something new that becomes not only normal, but somehow, sometimes, even better. This is covenant. Jesus is covenant. When Jesus sits down to dinner with his friends for the last time, he picks up the cup. And he says, this cup is my blood of the new covenant. Perhaps we can understand that to mean not a new covenant that supersedes the old, but the next experience of the same old covenant, a new way of hearing the old story. For his first disciples, this meant a new lease on old traditions, and eventually a departure from their Jewish heritage altogether, the only thing they'd ever known. In speaking those simple words, he was announcing the bottom falling out from under them, a new life that awaited them once the dust settled. What if those words mean the same for us? Perhaps Jesus was not a savior sent to perform a singular act for us, either of dying or rising. Perhaps he did not come as the son of God to overshadow us with his immense glory and power or to, as a model for us to follow in order to lead a godly life, or as a great physician to heal all of our hurts and cure all our ills, whether spiritual or physical. He is all these things, but they are not all that he is. In the prologue to his gospel, St. John tells us who Jesus is and what he has come to do. He writes, no one has ever seen God. It is God's only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who makes God known. Perhaps he makes God known by dropping the bottom out on us, by upending everything else we've ever known until there's nothing else to know, only for us to wait until the dust first settles. We read these words of sacred scripture and we take them to be doctrine, to be a set of beliefs. We've instituted a ritual supper around this dinner scene. We've written pages and pages, tomes. We've spilled both ink and blood defending our particular notions about what this meal means. But what if Jesus didn't come to institute a religion? Not even the correct religion. What if instead he came to invite us into his own heart, 
just as he is in the Father's heart. We heard St. Paul's words this past Sunday, have the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. Well, this is the mind of Christ. When his hour had come, John writes, Jesus, knowing that he had come from God and that he was going to God, knowing that God had started the engine on this thing and handed him the keys, shows his love in this way. He stripped down to his shirt sleeves and washed his disciples' feet. Foot washing only happens two other times in the Bible. The first is when Abigail washes David's feet. At the time, she's begging for her life and for her husband's life, afraid that David and his band of uh, militia will kill them. Washing David's feet was her way of saying she could do whatever he wanted, take anything he wanted, so long as he let them live. It was an act of desperation and complete submission. The other time this happened is when Mary of Bethany anointed Jesus' feet with her expensive perfume and then wiped them dry with her hair. She did that as a show of complete and abject gratitude for raising her brother Lazarus back to life. In both cases, the women performing this task were debasing themselves to make the point of how utterly powerless they were. And then here is the Son of the Most High God doing the very same thing. You can understand why Peter objects. This is a complete reversal of the way things are done. Foot washing is far too intimate an act, far too scandalous. Not even a slave would ever be commanded to wash someone else's feet. It was just too degrading, even for a slave. But now it gets worse. Jesus says, I'm your master and your teacher, and I have done this for you. No servant is greater than the master, right? And so if I have done this, you should do this. Of course, he's not just talking about foot washing, is he? He's talking about this love that he has for them. This love that is to the end. And so the bottom falls out. But did you catch why? So that we may give love as great as the love that we have been given. Sometimes we get hung up on that word commandment. It sounds like an order given to a soldier or a slave. If we follow, we're being obedient, being good. But if we don't, well, we're wrong, we're disobedient, we're bad. We tend to like commandments because we don't have to think that hard about it. All we have to do is follow, obey, imitate. But Jesus' whole point is that we can't know God by following or obeying or imitating. We can't know God through commandments, not his or anyone else's. And that's why our bottom falls out. There is no way for us to know God. This is the death of faith. But of course, we have to remember the story that we're in, don't we? In this story, we know death is the way to new life. The bottom falling out is the door opening to something new. As we aim for obedience or piety or holiness, and as we fail, or even sometimes as we attain these goals, we find them empty, wanting. Maybe we're really good at being religious. We're really good at being moral. But when we get there, we find there's nothing at all except our own empty pride, our own crushed expectations. And that, Jesus says, is exactly where we want to be. Because in each of these deaths, there is not only the there is the opportunity to trust Jesus not his teaching, 
not his death, not his resurrection, not his commandments, but him, the man himself, the one who washes our feet and lays down his life. In the scene that follows this immediately, Jesus tells his disciples that he is himself the way. To follow that way, the way of perfect love, is to be reborn, to experience salvation anew in every death, to continue along the journey of faith closer and closer to the Father, falling ever deeper and deeper into the heart and the mind of Christ, who is himself falling ever deeper into the heart and into the mind of God. This is what Jesus hopes for us, that we may abide in him and he in us, just as he abides in the Father and the Father abides in him. Notice what Jesus tells his friends. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. There's no consequence for failure, no eternal punishment if you don't do them. No problem for those who cannot bring themselves to wash a foot or to love someone else to the end. But neither is there an opportunity to experience life in a new way, a way that Jesus calls abundant. In the moment of this meal, we begin to see that this story is about far more than just saving the church or the world or the universe. It's not just about life after death. These are all great things to hope for, but they are incidental to the equation, mere side effects of the fundamental goal of what Jesus is trying to get for us here. Ultimately, this is all about letting go of the idea that you and I and Jesus and the Father are all separate entities. It's about seeing that my story gives way to our story, gives way to the story, the big picture of what God is doing for everything. We begin to see that we are one with Christ and that in Christ we are one with each other and with God. This is why Christ loves those people to the end, because his love for them, his love for us, it is his love for God. God is one, the scripture tells us. God is one, and in God, all are one. Loving Something, anything, everything with our whole being causes us to fall deeper and deeper into that interconnectedness. To see ourselves as a part of this greater reality. That's what abundant life is. That is life without beginning or end. Life that is, by definition, eternal. There is no destination for us to arrive at. Only a journey ever deeper, from depth to depth, as we find our place in the oneness of God. And so when the bottom falls out tonight, when Jesus is arrested and tried and unjustly executed, when his disciples are scattered and frightened, that's not a hitch in God's plans. It's a path to follow to follow through the pain and the confusion, to endure and to know Christ deeper and better and to abide in him as he abides in us until the dust settles and we regain our composure before the bottom falls out again. The bottom falls out and we find ourselves plummeting through doubt and despair and questioning and if we're willing to keep falling, to keep following the way, we may just find ourselves in another salvation, a deeper salvation. Until the bottom falls out again and we fall once again, deeper into God.
On this night we heard our Lord's commandment to love one another as he has loved us. And then we saw him demonstrate that love in the embarrassing act of washing his disciples' feet. We're not going to wash one another's feet tonight, but I will invite you to take a moment to wash your own hands or to wash the hands of someone who lives in this house, in your house with you. Especially during this pandemic when our uh, contact with other people has been so limited. This is a really intimate act. It's hard to underscore just how much it means to touch someone else in a caring way and to show such love. So please join me in hand washing. Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of love, unite your church in its commitment to humble service. Make us your faithful disciples. Speak words of truth and grace through us. Encourage us in self-giving acts of kindness. Let us love one another to the end as you have loved us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, tend to flocks, fields, and vineyards. Guide the hands of those who cultivate, farm, and garden. Teach us to love the earth as you have loved us, so that it may flourish and all may eat and be satisfied. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, you give us a new commandment to have love for one another. We give thanks for organizations that respond to disasters and for agencies that offer relief and humanitarian aid to populations in need. Tonight especially, we are grateful for the CDC, the World Health Organization, and all county health departments especially the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of love, give ear to all those who call upon you for any need of body or spirit. Provide for those who do not have enough to eat, those who are unemployed or underemployed, and those who rely on the generosity of others. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of love, you invite us to your table of mercy. Heal all divisions between members of this assembly, just as you have extended our gathering beyond the walls of our church building. Also now extend the hospitality of your table beyond our assembly, that your love and welcome be made known to all. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. For what and for whom? Do the people pray? Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, glorify your servants who walked by faith in this life and who now feast with you. Inspire us by the sacrifice of those who are imprisoned, persecuted, or martyred for their faith. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. According to your steadfast love, O oh God, hear these and all our prayers 
as we commend them to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we prepare our hearts and our tables to receive the Lord's Supper, let us pray. All thanks and praise be to you, Almighty God. In your great love, you freed your people Israel from slavery and a spirit of servitude. In a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of cloud by night, you led them safely through the sea into the wilderness there to await the promise of your salvation. Now, as we wander in our own wilderness, scattered in many houses and around many tables, we gather together around this story, remembering your faithfulness as you once again lead us from the chains of sin and the fearful grip of death by the guidance of your beloved Son. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his new commandment, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. As Israel waited for your salvation, O God, in the wilderness, 
so we also wait and earnestly pray for the day of his return and our own deliverance from this wilderness of polarization, climate change, and pandemic as we cry. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on this food and drink, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and join with all your saints in the feast which has no end. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you are not receiving the meal tonight, receive this blessing. May you fall ever deeper into the love and the oneness of God. Amen. If you are receiving the meal tonight, then hear this truth. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is abundant and eternal. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in a wonderful sacrament, you strengthen us with the saving power of your suffering, death, and resurrection. May this sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the fruits of your redemption will show forth in the way we live. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The meal has ended. Come, watch, and pray. I'll now invite you to clear your dinner tables as we listen to Psalm 22 being read. This is a symbolic action 
reminding us of how Jesus was stripped and humiliated by the soldiers after his arrest. Afterwards, our worship will pause and we will recess until tomorrow night when we return to behold Jesus' crucifixion and death. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors put their trust in you. They trusted and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and not human, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips, they shake their heads. Trust in the Lord, let the Lord deliver. Let God rescue him if God so delights in him. Yet you are the one who drew me forth from the womb and kept me safe on my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many young bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their jaws at me, like a slashing and roaring lion. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And you have laid me in the dust of death. Packs of dogs close in, close me in. A band of evildoers circles round me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones while they stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, be not far away. O oh, my help, hasten to my aid. Deliver me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of wild bulls you have rescued me. I will declare your name to my people. In the midst of the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord give praise. All you of Jacob's life.
Deliverance to a people yet 